Thank you, sister. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number four. Hebrews, chapter number four. The title of the message this morning is Seven Suggestions. Seven Suggestions. Now, that title is somewhat misleading because I'm not going to get to preach all seven of those suggestions. I'll only preach three of them this morning. And I don't know that I will ever get around to preaching the other four. But they're there in the Scripture, and you can search them out and find them if you would like. Let's read just a few verses together. We're going to kind of skip through chapter number four this morning to read some of these verses. Start with verse number one. Hebrews 4.1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Skip down to verse number 11. Verse number 11 says, Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now skip down to verse number 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession of faith. Now those verses being selected randomly probably don't give you a thought yet. But let me share with you the thought. I would love this morning to preach through the entire book of Hebrews. As I don't have time to preach all seven of the suggestions, I obviously don't have time to preach from all the book of the book of Hebrews. However, the reason I would like to do so is because there's a phrase that's used throughout the entire book of Hebrews. It's used in three of the verses that I just read. It's the phrase, let us. Two words, let us. Us. In all, that phrase is used 12 times in the book of Hebrews, more than any other book in the New Testament. Almost once for each of the 13 chapters in the book of Hebrews. That phrase, let us, most of the time would offer a suggestion. And that's where the title of the message came from, Seven Suggestions. I find as I look at all 12 of these phrases scattered throughout this book that they're not just used once for a topic and then changed. But there's actually seven different challenges or seven different topics that each of these phrases deal with. Hence the the thought, seven suggestions. There's seven suggestions that come from these 12 uses of the phrase let us again don't worry i'm not going to try to preach all seven of them but i do want to preach about some of the seven suggestions now i'm using that word suggestion in my mind with quotes around it if i were to give you a suggestion if i were to say something like let's go back to the back and have a cup of coffee well that would be just a suggestion i mean that's me thinking that would be something that would be good to do Maybe it would be something that I want to do. Maybe it would be something that I thought might be mutually beneficial to both of us. Maybe we need to go sit and chat for a while over a cup of coffee. But it's just a suggestion. If I make a suggestion, let's go do something. Let us go do something. You might not want to do it. You might think, I don't even like coffee. I'm not going to go back there and drink coffee with you. Uh, You might be thinking, I'm too busy. I've got no time to go back there and sit down and have a cup of coffee. You might be thinking, you're the last person I'm going to go sit down and talk to about anything. (laughs) But whatever the reason, if you don't want to take me up on my suggestion, you don't have to. Because it's just a suggestion. But what's interesting about this phrase used in the Bible is that God's speaking it. Now, he's speaking it through a human writer. Uh, There's a writer of the book of Hebrews who's pinning this phrase, but it's coming from the heart of God. So this is God saying 12 times, let us do something together you got to understand that when when god says let us do something together it's a little bit more than just a suggestion i'm not going to change the message it's not seven commandments from god i'm going to leave it seven suggestions from god but let's be real when god wants us to do something with him 
It's definitely more than a suggestion. This morning, let's look at the first three topics that these phrases talk about. The first three, interestingly enough, are all about the same topic. The first time the phrase is used is in verse number one. It's the first time in the whole book that it's used. And the first topic is concerning salvation. The first three times the phrase let us is used, it's a challenge to let us go into God's rest. Now, that might not make much sense to you yet, but go back and read with me verse number one of chapter number four. Uh, the writer says, let us therefore, excuse me, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. I want you to notice some phrases, some words in that verse. Number one, notice right up there at the top, first two words, let us. There's our phrase. This is God making a suggestion. God's saying through the writer, Let's you and me do something together. Second, I want you to notice what he's encouraging us to do in that verse. He says, let us therefore fear. Now that's a little different for the Bible. Uh, seldom does God ever challenge us to be afraid. As a matter of fact, you've probably heard it. I've said it many times. That they say in the Bible, there's 365 fear nots. Now I'm going to be honest. I've never read through the Bible and marked them all, so I can't verify whether there's 365 of them or not, but it sounds good. Uh, the, the saying is there's one for every day of the year. And God, more often than not, does say, fear not. However, in this verse, God's saying, let us therefore fear something. Very unusual for God to command us or to suggest that we fear something. But as you read through the rest of the verse and on into the rest of the chapter, you'll find out that what he wants us to be afraid of is well worth our fear. He's afraid, he wants us to be afraid that we may not go to heaven, that we may actually spend eternity separated from him forever. And if there's anything that you ought to fear, my friend, you ought to fear an eternity being separated from God. So first, first phrase, let us. Second word I want you to notice in the verse is let us fear. But then here's what he challenges us to do. He says, let's be afraid that we do not enter in your second phrase or, or third phrase, enter into his rest. The Bible is challenging us to make sure that we enter into God's rest. Now, maybe you don't understand what that means. What, is it, what in the world is God talking about when he says we need to enter into God's rest? It's interesting to me, I've told you this many times before, how God uses different phrases to describe salvation. Throughout the Bible, God gives us different pictures of what salvation is by describing it with different words. For example, more times than not, when we talk about salvation, we ask somebody, are you saved? Well, that means salvation, but it means, it means, have you been rescued from your sin? That's literally what saved means. It's a picture of what salvation is. Saved is rescued from sin. But we could also say it this way. Have you ever been born again? We're still talking about salvation, but now we're emphasizing a different aspect of salvation. We're not talking about the rescue from sin now. We're talking about the new life that you get when you get saved. There's other phrases. We could talk about, have you been washed in the blood? Or as a lot of folks down south say, have you been washed in the blood? Uh, e either one is good. What we're talking about there is, have you been cleansed from your guilt and shame? Now, all of these, all of these are phrases to describe salvation. They're interchangeable. There's another phrase, and we hardly ever use that. But it's the one that's being used in this verse. We could ask somebody, have you ever entered into God's rest? Because God's rest is another description of salvation. Uh, if you spent the time to study the book of Hebrews, you'd see that the writer of the book of Hebrews has been talking about God's rest for a while. He started around about chapter 3, verse number 11. And he'll keep talking about it on into chapter 4, verse number 11. And it really kind of overlaps because he's tying it in with other topics. But those are the sections where he really mentions God's rest over and over again. And, and he's talking about it because he's talking about the Old Testament nation of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt and as they were going towards the promised land. 
in the place of God's rest for those Old Testament Jews, it was the promised land. When they got over into the promised land, they could rest. They wouldn't have to be journeying every day. Uh, they could build some houses, not have to live in tents. They could build some fortified walls where they wouldn't always have to be on guard from their enemy. They could enjoy a time of rest. So in the Old Testament, God's rest was the promised land. It was going into the land of Israel. We're in the New Testament. And most of us probably would not want to go and live in the land of Israel. I'm kind of teetering on the wall. I think I, I might would. But most of us probably wouldn't want to go and live our lives in the land of Israel. To us, God's rest is not the land of Israel. To us, God's rest is salvation and it's heaven. And so what the scripture is doing here is it's challenging us to be very careful, to be very fearful, lest we miss entering into God's salvation. Now why, why does God's rest, that term, how does it picture salvation? Well, you have to understand that when you get saved, the moment you get saved, you enter into God's care. From that moment on, God is in charge of your life. We talk about being Christians. We're submitted to God. God's our Lord. He's our master. He's in charge of our life. Do you get it? If he's in charge of our life, he's also responsible for our life. If the only thing that I am to do as a Christian, and this is true, if the only thing that I am to do as a Christian is to obey and trust God, if that's the only thing that I'm to do, and, and that is the only task that a Christian is tasked with is trusting and obeying God. If that's the case, then I can kick back and relax because that means if I do what God tells me to do, he's responsible for everything that happens in my life. I am totally in God's care. Now, I can tell you're a Baptist right there because a Pentecostal would have shouted. <laughs> <laughs> You see, I can rest. Why? Because God's totally responsible for my... I don't have to... No, I have to obey God. I have to do what God tells me to do. And God's not going to tell me to sit in the recliner all day. But I don't have to worry about paying my bills. Why? Because He's in charge. If I'm doing what He tells me to do, then He's responsible for paying my bills. I don't have to worry about my body, my health. Now, I can't eat and balloon up like a big old... A, big old balloon. I can't do that. But at the same time, if I'm obeying God and doing what God tells me to do, I don't have to worry about diseases and about dying early. Why? Because God's in charge and God's responsible. Once I get saved, I have entered into God's rest. I got to tell you, God's rest is a very, very good term to describe what it is to be saved. But at the same time, let's face it, a lot of folks, a lot of Christians have a hard time with resting in God. They have a hard time trusting in God. To be honest, what a lot of Christians do is we worry and we doubt. Uh, matter of fact, uh, that's a predominant characteristic in a lot of Christians. And, and there's some reasons why some Christians tend to worry and doubt more than others. Some were just raised hard. Some, some learned early in life, you can't trust people. And so they have a hard time trusting God. Then there's others, and they hang around with their own crowd. Did you, know, did you know that worry and doubt is contagious? If you hang around with people that worry and doubt all the time, guess what you're going to do sooner or later? You're going to worry and doubt. Why? Because it's like a disease. Uh, it's contagious. Good news is faith and trust is contagious too. If you'll hang around with people that have faith and trust in God, you'll catch that just like you'll catch worry and doubt. That's one reason why God commands the Christians to be a part of a Bible-believing, God-fearing, faithful church. Because he knows if you'll hang around with other Christians that have got faith, you'll catch that disease just like you catch the disease of worry and doubt. 
And I suppose the biggest reason why some folks have a hard time, even though they're saved, entering into God's rest, is because they just won't do what is required. What's required? Remember what I told you the condition is? You've got to trust and obey God. If you trust and obey God, you can kick back and relax. Why? Because he's in charge, therefore he's responsible. But if you're not going to trust him and obey him, if you're going to do things your own self, you might as well worry and doubt because God's not responsible. You have plotted your course and you're going to have a very, very difficult life even though you may be a Christian. But here's what I want you to get in this Bible passage. The command that God's given in verse number one, the suggestion that he's making, is let us therefore fear lest we don't enter into his rest. He's saying that we need to be fearful that we are not going to enter into his rest. He's talking about those Old Testament Jews, those that came out of the, the land of Egypt. They're going towards the promised land. You realize that entire generation, the entire generation of Jews that left the land of Egypt, not a single one of them over the age of adulthood, not a single one of them entered into the promised land. Not a one of them entered into God's rest. And verse number two tells us why they didn't. They were at least in part doing what God said to do. They were out in the wilderness. They were following the cloud. They were following the pillar of fire. They were listening at least some to what Moses and Joshua said. But there was one thing he says in verse number two that they did not do. It says they were not mixed with faith. They were not trusting and believing God. I don't know if you remember how their journey ended for them. But they got literally to the Jordan River and they sent 12 spies into the promised land. Joshua was one of those 12 spies. He was still a young man. And those 12 men come back with a report of how beautiful the land was. But 10 of them say, hey, there's giants over there. We couldn't possibly take that land. Two people said we can take it. 10 said we cannot. And the nation said, well, let's just go back to Egypt. They got to the River Jordan and they refused to go in. And this verse, verse number two, is telling us why they didn't go in. They didn't go in because they lacked faith to trust God. They didn't believe God was big enough to kill the giants. They didn't believe God was big enough to overcome their enemies. They didn't believe God was big enough to be able to take care of the problems that they might experience once they crossed over the river Jordan. They lacked faith. What keeps people out of heaven? Every week I tell you that there's two things. Most of the time I emphasize the last one, the second one, repentance. And the reason I emphasize it so much is because in my life I knew the truth a long time. And I believed the truth a long time before I got saved. In my life, the problem was not my faith. In my life, the problem was my repentance. I did not repent before Jesus Christ. However, we don't need to overlook the first one either. The Bible is telling us in this verse that the reason that entire generation of Jews did not go into the promised land was they didn't have faith in God. They did not believe God was big enough. Could I just emphasize to you this morning for a moment that you not only have to yield yourself to Jesus Christ, but you have to believe on Jesus Christ Let's just use a more common term. You have to trust in Jesus Christ. And if you trust in Jesus Christ, not only does repentance tell on you, but faith tells on you. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, there's going to be a faith about you, a confidence about you, a confidence about you and your God that other people are going to be able to see. You're not going to be afraid of what this world is doing. You're not going to be afraid of the situations and the circumstances that you're living in. You're not going to be afraid because why? Because you understand this precept. I'm in God's rest. I'm in God's care. I have God in charge. Therefore, God is responsible. So me wasting my time worrying about everything that might happen to me, even the problems that I'm going through, it's literally just a waste of my life. The faith that we have manifests itself 
shows itself, demonstrates itself, just like the lack of it demonstrated itself in the lives of these people. The first time this phrase is used, let us, the topic is salvation. And the admonition is, let's make sure that we have faith in the God we say we trust. But like I said, there's at least three verses. There are three verses in this one chapter, but there's at least three verses with each of them talking about this phrase. The second one is down in verse number 11. In verse number 11, he says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. I don't know if you know what a paradox is, but a paradox is a seeming contradiction. A seeming contradiction. There's a seeming contradiction contradiction in that verse he says we've got to labor to enter into his rest now you think about that for a moment typically you either labor or you rest you don't labor to rest you might be at rest and you're not laboring or you're laboring but you're not at rest those two just don't go together but in this verse what God is saying seemingly contradicts itself he says we need to work hard to rest. That's what he's saying. We need to labor to rest. But, but then again, let's remember what this rest is talking about. It's a symbol. It's a picture of salvation. So he's saying we need to work hard to be saved. Now you think about that for a second because your first impulse is we don't have to work hard to be saved. I'm going to disagree with you. We do have to work hard. The problem is most people don't know what they have to work hard at doing. You see, a lot of folks think they've got to work hard to keep the Ten Commandments so that they'll be saved. Or they need to work hard to be good so that they'll be saved. Or they need to work hard at not doing bad so that they'll be saved. Friend, none of that will save you. That's not the kind of work you need to do to be saved. You say, well, what kind of work do I need to do to be saved? There's one task you need to do. In order to be saved, you need to work hard to trust Jesus and to trust Him completely. The work that you and I have to do is we have to trust Jesus Christ. Let me tell you a secret. Every religion in the world, except for the gospel, teaches a work hard salvation. You either have to be a part of a certain church, you have to be immersed in certain water, or you have to take uh, maybe a loaf, a waver, a piece of bread from a certain person's hand. You've got to confess your sins to a certain person. You've got to belong to a certain body of believers. Uh, somehow you've got to work in order to get saved. Let me tell you something about every religion on this, on this planet. Every one of them has the wrong message. None of those works will ever save you. The only work that you need to enter into God's rest is to trust Jesus Christ and Him alone. You say, well, preacher, I wouldn't call that a work. It must be a work, and it must be pretty hard, because most people would rather do anything and everything else than just trust Jesus Christ and trust Him alone. But what verse 11 is telling us is, you've got to work hard to enjoy God's rest. What work must I do? I must work hard to trust Him. Now let me tell you, there's going to be certain times in your life, even as a Christian, when it's going to be difficult to trust Jesus. Usually, it's when we go through times we don't like or don't understand. When you're going through a storm and you can't see what's on the other side, when you're going through an event that you would have chosen to have avoided, that's when it's hard work to trust Jesus Christ. But what this verse is saying is, if you'll work hard to trust Him, you will have His rest. Friend, as hard as it is to trust Jesus Christ, it's worth every effort you expand because God's rewards, God's rest is well worth the toil of your labor. Second time that he uses this phrase, let us, verse number 11, he's still talking about salvation there. He was talking about salvation in verse number one. 
He's still talking about salvation in verse number 2. So the thought is still the same. He's saying, let us enter into his rest. The third time that he uses it is found in verse number 14. In verse number 14, he says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed in the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us, there's our phrase, let us hold fast our profession. That same thought is repeated later on in the book. It's not in this first chapter, but it's repeated in the book of Hebrews 10.23. In 10.23 it says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now, in order for you to really understand what, what this admonition is, you might need to know a little bit about the book of Hebrews. The people that the writer of this book is writing to are Hebrews. They're Jews. And they're Jews who have professed, claimed that Jesus Christ was their Savior. But if you know anything about the Bible, the Bible New Testament history, you know that especially the Jews, the Jewish nation, began to persecute those that accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they, per they persecuted their own people worse than anybody else. I mean, if you were a Gentile and you were passing through the land and you believed on Jesus Christ as your Savior, they might run you off, they might beat you, they might even try to kill you, but you're just a stranger, you're not their big problem. Do you know who their big problem was? It was Jews that were getting saved. And so if you as a Jew got saved, they didn't just want to run you off, they didn't just want to beat you, they wanted to kill you. And so these Hebrews that accepted Jesus as their Savior, they were being persecuted by their own people. And many of those Jews, because of the persecution, were renouncing Jesus Christ. That means instead of saying that Jesus was God, they began to say, He's not God. Instead of saying, He is our Savior, they began to say, He's not a God at all. They were renouncing who Jesus Christ was. And so the writer of this book is saying, God saying through the writer of this book, let us not abandon Jesus Christ, but let us hold fast, hold on hard to our profession of faith, our statement that we believe that Jesus is God and that Jesus is is our Savior. The thought there is, don't you give up Jesus Christ no matter what happens to you. All three of these let us deal with the category of salvation. Let us enter into his rest. This one is really let us stay in his rest. We've said we believe that Jesus is God. Now, let's don't go back on that. Let's, let's cling to what we have already said we believe. It's hard for me to imagine that anybody would renounce Jesus. I'll be honest, I've been following him for 40-something years. I haven't found any reason why I would want to renounce Jesus Christ. I have found out he's good. I have found out he's better than good. I have found out that his promises are true, that he actually exceeds his promises. There's never been a time in my life where I wanted to back away from Jesus Christ. But then again, I've never faced a time like the people of this book we're facing. I've never, I've never faced a time when people would show up and maybe seize my property and my possessions, take away my job, my income, threaten my family, arrest, beat, even kill my family in front of my eyes. I've never faced a time like that. I've never faced a time where I was beaten for Jesus Christ. I've never faced a time where I had to go to prison for Jesus Christ. I've never faced a time where I was scourged for Jesus Christ. I've never faced a time where my life was threatened for Jesus Christ. I say, I've never faced a time like that. I have a feeling that those kinds of times are coming. And I have a feeling that they're coming faster than many of us realize that they're coming. You say, well, preacher, when those days come, what are you going to say? I say this often. I'm a coward at heart. I don't know for sure what I'm going to say. And I am a coward at heart. I know what I want to say. I want to say the same thing that the writer of this book is saying. What he was saying is, it doesn't matter what they do to you. 
Jesus Christ is worth whatever price you have to pay. <laughs> she's got a pad. She can't talk. She's got a pad. She wrote amen on it, and she's waving it at me. That's a Pentecostal right there. <laughs> now get this. All three of these deal with salvation. All three of them are saying, this is God making a suggestion. By the way, this is the first suggestion he made in this book. These are the first three times this phrase is used. And there's four times, counting the Hebrews 10, 23, where he gives this phrase in relationship to this topic. The topic is, let us go into God's rest. This is the first time, this is the most used time for this phrase, and it deals with, let us be saved. Let us not abandon the Savior that has saved us. I think that's a pretty good first suggestion on God's part. First suggestion, let us enter into his rest. Second suggestion, found over in the book of Hebrews chapter number 6. Second suggestion that I'm going to give you anyway. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 1, it's let us go deeper into God's word. Let us go deeper into God's word. Verse number 1, Hebrews 6, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, there's our phrase, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now, this is what the writer is telling us in this verse. He's saying we need to go on deeper into the word of God. Uh, th that phrase that he uses, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. The principles, that word means the foundation. It means the beginning blocks. Literally, literally, I read this years ago, it means the ABCs. What the writer is saying is we need to leave the elementary doctrines of the Word of God and we need to go on into some more challenging doctrines of the Bible. Now, uh, you may not quite comprehend. He's not saying that the ABC doctrines aren't important because they are. As a matter of fact, he lists six of what he calls the ABC doctrines. He starts them in verse number one and he completes his list in verse number two. Look what he says in verse number one. He says, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again this foundational doctrine. What foundational doctrine? Repentance of dead works. He says, repentance, walking away from your old sins, that's just a simple doctrine. He goes on to say, not laying again the foundation of faith toward God. And then in verse number two, he says, not laying again the doctrine of baptism. And he goes on, not laying again the doctrine of the laying on of hands. And again, not laying the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. And again, not laying the doctrine of eternal judgment. Those six doctrines are what this writer calls the first principles, the ABC doctrines of the Bible. Could I just say, if those are the elementary doctrines of the Bible, most Christians in this day and age today have never even gotten into preschool because that's some pretty deep waters right there. But what he's saying is we need to go deeper into the Word of God than just understanding the most basic doctrines. What are the most basic doctrines? Repentance. You need to turn away from your sin. Faith towards God. Getting baptized. There's a heaven and there's a hell. These are just the beginnings of the doctrines of the Bible. The writer of this book had noticed something about the quality of the believers that he was coming across. And he describes them in chapter 5. Look back at chapter 5, verse number 12. He says, I've been, I've been around you, you believers. And he says, here's what I've noticed. Verse number 12. When for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again what be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. He says, what I've noticed is the Christians we're producing in this day and age, they don't know their Bible. Oh, they know, they know about repentance. They know about faith in Jesus Christ. 
They know that there's a resurrection. They know that they need to be baptized. They know there's a heaven and a hell. But he says, they don't know much more than just the ABCs of the words of God. Friend, I say it again. If he's calling those the elementary doctrines, we've got a lot of folks in our day and age that don't even understand those doctrines. They still don't understand today what repentance is. There's a lot of Christians that don't seem to understand the importance of baptism. And, and, and these are what he says are the ABC doctrines. What's he challenging? What's God challenging these believers to do with him? Let us go deeper into the word of God. Could I tell you this morning, God wrote a big book. It's got 62 books in it. It's got a lot of chapters in every one of those books. It's got lots of verses in every one of those books. Why did God write such a big book? I don't know for sure, but I'm going to guess the reason is he's got some things he wants us to know. You write a big book like that, and I'm just thinking there's something in it he's trying to tell us. There's not just one or two things he's trying to teach us. He wants us to learn more. Why? Why would God want us to know more things than just how to be saved? Maybe. Maybe it's because he wants us to live a more righteous life than many Christians are living. Maybe, maybe it's because he wants us to live a more successful life than Christians are. And by the way, success for a Christian is not measured by how big your bank account is or how big your house is or by what size car you drive. Uh, there's having a home with little babies being born, seeing those babies grow up to be young men and women that serve Jesus Christ, that know who God is, that know how to share Jesus Christ with others, that know themselves how to live. Friend, that's a successful life. Uh, you won't be able to look at my bank account when I'm gone. I don't think, not unless I hit the lottery between now and then, which I'm not playing it, so it's going to be hard for me to hit it. You're not going to be able to look and tell whether I was a successful person by my bank account, but I hope you can look around my casket and see, hey, that man was a successful man. Maybe God gave us that big book because he wants us to be more righteous. Maybe he gave us that big book because he wants us to be more successful. Hey, maybe he gave us that big book because he wants us to be more happy. Do you know it's an amazing thing? How many people got money? No happiness. Hollywood's the last place that I'd want to point up as an example. But folks got money out there, let's face it. They got, they got bods out there. They got limousines out there. They got fame out there. They got all kinds of recognition. Hey, they got, they got massive parties that are aired on TV, Grammys and all kinds. And that's, that's just them patting themselves on the back. That's, that's all that is. But friend, you, have, you ever notice they're not very happy out there. Their drug addiction rate, very high. Their suicide rate, very high. Their divorce rate, out of the roof. Their perversion rate, beyond comprehension. Listen. Maybe God gave us a book as big as the Bible because he doesn't just want us to go to heaven when we die. But maybe he wants us to have a joyful life. And this is God's suggestion. Now, this is coming from God, so it's more than a suggestion. But God's suggestion in Hebrews 6, verse number 1 is, let us go deeper into his word. You've heard the expression, He's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. I have never met anybody that was so heavenly minded, they were no earthly good. Don't you worry about becoming so smart in the things of God that you become of no use to this world. Because if you really learn what the book's telling you, you will become the most valuable people that God's ever used. It's not about puffed up knowledge. It's about a changed life. And that's what the Word of God does. Second suggestion, Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 1, let us go deeper into the Word of God. Third suggestion that I'm going to give you is over in the book of Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 1. Seven suggestions, only going to give you three. Look at chapter 12, verse number 1. 
He says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before him. There's two let us in that verse. And they're really about similar but different topics, so I'm not going to discuss them both. I had to stop sometime. I'm, I'm just going to discuss one. The first one's the one I want to talk about. Here he's saying, let us go further into God's presence. Let us go further into God's presence. The first one is, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Uh, here in that verse, the writer of the book of Hebrews is describing our life as if it were a race. He uses that term in the last phrase, that we will run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, I'm not much at running in these days. Uh, got too old and too out of geometric proportions to be able to run. There was a day when I could run. and could run fairly fast. But you know, even the fastest runner won't win a race if a weight is tied around his neck. The verse is describing the weight of sin wrapped around the Christian's neck while he's trying to run the race for God. You can't win a race if you're way down with the anvil of sin. So his, his suggestion there is, let's do this together. This is God saying, let us lay aside the weight of sin. God's not telling you to lay it aside. By the way, none of these suggestions, all of them are built off the phrase, let us. This is God speaking through an earthly writer. So this is God not commanding you to do something. This is God saying, I'll do this with you. Let's together get this albatross off your neck. This weight that is slowing you down, let's get it out of your life. Well, if we get the sin out of our life, what are we able to do? We're able to get closer to God. You know, the thing that keeps us out of the presence of God is not His disdain for us. It's not that He's too busy to welcome us into His presence. The reason we don't get to get more into the presence of God is because there's so much sin on us, we can't get to the door. You've seen those videos on Facebook of the dog that's got the big stick and he's trying to get to the door? He keeps, he keeps hammering the door, but he's got a big stick in his mouth. It's wider than the door is. He can't get through the door because he's got this big stick in his mouth. We're Christians, and we can't get in the presence of God because we got this big stick in our mouth. It's sin. And what God is suggesting to us is, why don't you let me help you put that stick down? Why don't you let me help you get that sin out of your life? Now, you say, I, I've tried and I can't. I know that's the reason God's saying, let me do it with you. It's interesting, this, this race that he's describing in this verse, we, we might think of it as though it's a horizontal plane. Most of our races are. You're going to run a race. We're going to get the track level. We're not going to be climbing uphill or going downhill. We're not going to give any advantage to anybody. It's going to be a perfectly level, a horizontal race. But in truth, the race that you and I are running as Christians is not a horizontal, it's a vertical. Our whole goal is to get closer to God. Sin not only weighs us down, sin holds us back. It pulls us down. Too many Christians are seeing how much world they can cram into their lives and still run the race. The problem is you can't climb higher with all that worldliness inside of you, with all that carnality, with all that sinfulness. It's time we as Christians quit trying to see how much trash we can carry, how much sinful weight we can carry. It's time for us to see how much we can chunk and still be useful to this world. Our goals are backwards. We ought not be trying to see how much of the world we can carry with us. We ought to be, say, be, be striving to see how much of this world we can do without. Friend, I got news. Most of us could chunk a good load and we'd still be doing all right. What's God doing? God, speaking to the writer of Hebrews, is making seven suggestions. In this book. The phrase is used more than seven times, but seven categories, seven topics of things he wants to do with us. He wants us to enter with him into his rest. 
He wants us with him to go deeper into his word. He wants us with him to come further into his presence. We're still close to the new year. What are we, the 15th, 17th, 19th day, 19th day. I'll get it right now. But that's still the beginning of a new year. You still got time to start this year out right. You're doing good. You're in church. Some of you have been in church every single service this year. That's good. That's a good beginning. Some of you started reading your Bibles. Don't just read them now. That's not a race. The race is not to see how many words I can read. No, the race is to find out how close to God you can get. And, and reading that Bible, going to church, giving your time, all of those things, praying, all of those things are to the end that we might get closer into his presence, that we might feel him more and more. Why not today? Make up your mind. You're going to let God take you on a walk you've never imagined before. Take you on a journey that you've never even dreamed possible. It's the walk. It's the journey of him being with you in all the affairs of your life. In all the mountains that you climb and all the valleys that you go down through with all the problems that you have and all the victories that you experience, why don't you let God walk with you through them all? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the people. I thank you for their attention. Thank you for the good spirit. God, I don't know what else I could do except to hush and let you speak to hearts. So God, please, would you do so? If there's a person here that's lost, never really trusted you, God, would you help them to trust you today? If there's a person here that needs to get closer, deeper in the word, closer to the presence of God, please speak to hearts. Show us how to do that. Go with us as we do it. Accomplish your will, your work. We'll do our best to give you the praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake.